and water is good and it refreshes us and everything. But if you've ever seen a flash flood or gotten pulled out by a riptide or whatever, like water is very powerful. It does, it has some powerful qualities and sexuality does too. And so if, you know, you have to be careful that there's beautiful things about it and there's powerful things and that it can be destructive if you're not, if you don't put it in the right context and use it in the right context. So fire and water, you know, okay. All right, so this is another way we're gonna talk about to understand married love. And it can be very helpful in, underst in, in us next week when we start understanding some of these challenges and, and questions about um, sexual morality, okay? Um, so I'm gonna talk about each of these in terms of human marriage between spouses and also talk about where it applies to that marriage relationship between Christ and the church, okay? So these are the four essential elements of married love. Married love should be free, we talked about that when we were talking about the annulment. You had to be free to enter into the marriage, right? Total, that's that covenant, that love, right? That total unconditional love. Faithful, that's, you know, the sixth commandment, right? We're going to be faithful to the spouse. And then fruitful, that's that life-giving part, the love and the life part, okay? So free. The husband and wife must freely choose to give themselves to each other in marriage. That means they're not under any kind of constraint, physical, emotional, psychological, legal uh, constraints of any kind. And legal, when I say that, I mean civilly legal and, you know, church law legal, right? Can canonically legal, okay? So they're not impeded by any natural or church law, which we covered in the annulment stuff, right? Okay? How does that relate to the marriage of Christ to the church? In John's Gospel, chapter 10, he, uh, Christ freely chose to die for us, his bride, the church. Jesus says, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. He freely gave his life on behalf of the bride, the church. That married love must be total. Husband and wife make of themselves a total mutual self-gift, physically, spiritually, emotionally. The two shall become one flesh. You've probably heard me, that's about like the seventh time we've quoted that scripture today, right? I give myself completely to my spouse and we become one flesh. There's nothing held back. So we think of those vows in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad, okay? How does this relate to the marriage of Christ to the church? The sacrifice of the spouses for each other reflect Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross, that ultimate total self-gift, which we experience in ourselves in the body of Christ, the Eucharist. We receive that complete total self-gift in the Eucharist. And it, again, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, no one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So he's giving us that great gift of love the marriage the love of marriage should be faithful the unity of the spouses their mutual gift of self and the good of ch any children that they have demand that complete faithfulness sexual fidelity is primary but not the only source of faithfulness so there are many other ways to be unfaithful to a spouse besides direct sexual infidelity Things like pornography, um, drug or alcohol abuse. Some people can be more faithful to an addiction and lose faithfulness to their spouse because they've been drawn in by this other thing, right? Um, money, uh, position, uh, and, and like work. Have you ever heard of somebody say they're married to their job, right? When my... Go, and, and, and not that work isn't a good thing and a necessary thing and the spouses have to do this, but, but when that becomes more important and takes priority or precedence over my relationship with my spouse, that's a faithfulness issue, okay? How does this relate to the marriage of Christ to the church? The faithfulness between the spouses should be a reflection of the faithfulness of God to his covenant and Christ to his church. So in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you always. I will not leave you orphans. In other words, I'm going to be faithful to you. And even when you can't see me anymore because I've ascended into heaven, 
I'm still going to be there with you because I'm going to send my, my, because the Father's going to send the Spirit to dwell in you and I'm going to leave you my body and blood so that I'm still there with you always, Emmanuel. Okay? And then finally, the fruitful. Marriage must always be open to the gift of life. So children are the supreme gift and the crowning glory of married love. And even, like we said, if the couple's not blessed with the gift of children, the marriage should bear fruit in other ways. And the couple should always be open to receiving that gift if God chooses to give that gift of children. And we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about that a lot next week because we're going to talk about contraception and natural family planning and some things like that that are going to get more into that. So that's why we're laying this piece of groundwork. How does this relate to the marriage of Christ to his church? Christ's relationship with us should bear fruit in the world. Jesus says in John chapter 15, Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. So he's saying, stay connected to me, and then I expect you, then I will help you, and I expect that there will be fruit born out of our relationship. Okay? All right, so looking ahead, any questions about those four things? Any clarification? Anything makes sense? Clear? Okay. So what teachings of the church on marriage and sexuality might you look at differently after today's lesson? Is there anything that you see differently that was kind of opened your eyes a little bit or some new thing that helped? Go ahead. I really like how you think about the senses. Because I think a lot of the times, like, you're a spirit, mm -hmm. but if you don't control the senses, okay. you allow that spirit to show in those ways, like, more control of your, the way that you have those senses to your spouse okay. would probably help a lot okay. in a marriage. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. So, like, for each of those, like, qualities, you mentioned the free, total, fruitful. It's not just a one-time thing on your wedding day. Hmm. I think love... It's not always going to feel good. And I've heard some priests say, like, you know, a few couple getting married, like, you know, husband, you know, you're going to wake up, she's going to have some gray hairs one day. Or, you know, the wife, you're going to wake up and he's going to be like, snoring and, you know, he's got some wrinkles. <laughs> so the point is, like, love is not going, it's not going to be a feeling, it's an action, it's a choose. So your vows, you've been in good faith, you're permanent, you're good to go forever. But I think choosing to love, right? And I think the people struggle with, or at least I've heard the high school was the NCC talk about it too, is like, what if you fall out of love? Like, you made a promise. You said in sickness or in health. Like you promised that, you know, if something <clears> terrible <throat> happened to you, like I'm still gonna love you. So I think for a lot of when you see marriages fall apart, maybe they've forgotten like hey, this was a choice. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a choice I made that on that day I promised that even if things got bad, like, I'm still gonna love you. Like or, or you know, yeah. appearances change, people get older, like oh, I'm still gonna love you. Um, so I'm just reminded yes. of yeah, you know, when I counsel couples for marriage <clears> or, long successful marriages you ask them like what's the secret and they're like you just choose to love your spouse like it's gonna, it's gonna get rough you don't always gonna agree with you you're gonna fight but like still choose to love so mm -hmm. there's times when it's not gonna feel good to love you have to choose to do so the love you fall out of that's the arrows you know when it starts to wane yeah. that's why we don't base a marriage on that we talked about the greek words for love and agape and everything so yeah so that's, that's the love that kind of starts, you know, but the agape, if it's a choice, you can keep, you, that's your own will. You have control over that. Okay, good. Thank you. Anything else? I thought the innocent until proven guilty was very, like, eye-opening. Okay. Like, it's a marriage. We're going to call it a marriage, but now that things are going south here, let's take a look back at what was actually happening. What happened at the time. Yeah. yeah. We're not evaluating your marriage. We're evaluating the marriage, the, what happened on the time of the sacrament. But I think another misconception <clears throat> that you mentioned was like being divorced isn't, like simply divorced is not a sin. And I feel like a lot of people think yes. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think once they get divorced, they can't come to church. They can't, I mean, you can receive communion. Yeah. You know, if you're civilly divorced, you just, it, it's the, when you get the remarriage and you haven't annulled the first marriage, that's where you get into trouble. It's so like that's where the acts come in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Anything else? 
All right, awesome. I had a closing song, but we didn't pass out songbooks, so we're just not going to. We'll just do a closing prayer. And, um, and we'll ask Father to give us a blessing since he's here at the end of the prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, we thank you for this time together. We ask you to just send the uh, blessing of your Holy Spirit upon us to help us in understanding and embracing these teachings uh, that you have given us about the truth of marriage, that we may recognize that, uh, that what you have shown us in marriage is meant to be a beautiful expression of your love for us, your bride, the church. And just uh, keep our hearts open to understanding and following your truth and your will in all things. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with, and with your, your spirit. spirit. And Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next week. <laughs> 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 well, technically... Uh -oh.